Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 781. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 13th, Friday the 13th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us on another program of Anglican on Scripture. We're glad you could be here. We're, okay, we're glad we could be here. You know, it's not easy to show up here twice a week. George runs a full-time church uh, and has church duties. You were at a hospital today uh, uh, doing a visitation before the show. I, on a Friday, sometimes like to sleep in. Wasn't happening. Had a, a customer uh, email me this morning, so I had to do my stuff. And we are very gracious that uh, God has allowed us the time to do this and that has allowed us the audience to to do what we love. This is kind of our, our side hustle, and it's a lot of fun, George. Um, how you doing? I am being run off my feet. Uh, for some reason, this is uh, uh, Government Frustration Day. I've got two parishioners in prison, one in a county jail facing a DUI charge, the other in the state jail serving on you know, a third year of a five-year term for, for theft. And the, the state of Florida has changed how they do visitations, how they do letters. It used you, I would write her every two weeks or so, and she'd get a letter. I'd send cards. State of Florida announced, instead of mailing to the, the prison, you have to mail to a central place where they'll scan it, and then they will give the scan mm -hmm. to the uh, inmate. And I can understand this because people put drugs inside cards. Sure. Yeah. And it's but just another step, uh, another step in the dehumanization of evil. Uh, I'm not saying the state is wrong to do this. It's probably a good choice, but it's just another thing when you're in prison and you know letters are so important uh, communication with the outside world. And then uh, I'm trying to find uh, foster care for a six year old and eight year old whose parents are meth addicts who live in the woods. Uh, uh, good Episcopalians, of course. Uh, they wear they wear loafers and uh, uh, drive a Volvo, drink wine and cheese, and live in the woods and are meth heads, crackheads. And I, in doing all this, uh, they have a grandmother who's disabled in the prayer parish who's unable to care for them. My wife told me as soon as I mentioned the problem, no. I said, no, what? No, we are not taking yeah. it. Yeah. Um, we're having trouble with three dogs, let alone a six-year-old and eight-year-old. And, you know, in Florida, we have 20,000 children in foster care, and there's 6,000 waiting placement. So as soon as we get the paperwork done and all this and that, they're 6,001 and two. And these 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 kids, you know, the eight-year-old can't read or write. Uh, they have behavioral issues. They have taken upon themselves their parents' uh, bad uh, behaviors. They've never been socialized, if you will. They're wild children. Yeah. I don't know how badly damaged they are. They're going to need extensive social services and care. Maybe forever. I don't know. I don't even know if there's fetal alcohol syndrome involved in this as well. But I just am so struck by uh, the evil and depravity that we have in society and the massive indifference that we have. And, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, the government takes care of everything. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no. Governments, they have a hard enough time delivering the mail, let alone <laughs> rescuing children and uh, helping the poor and the sick. Well, that's the, the great divide. In your 20s and 30s, you think the government is there to help. Yet your desire is to pay your taxes and uh, you throw all your problem, problems off to the government because you think the government cares. And by the time you're 35 and 40, you finally realize the government doesn't care. They don't care at all. And they have the social services, they have the bureaucracy, they have the rules. And when you really look into what they're doing, what they're doing is just providing a status quo because they yeah. don't care. We have a church affiliated orphanage in our county. Mm -hmm. uh, that our church is one of the founders. All the churches in the county got together to start this 25 years ago. And my first step was, okay, I'll call the orphanage and we'll, you know, get it done. They kicked us out. They kicked all visitors out when COVID started. 
And then we had the Biden administration. The Biden administration put in new rules about uh, who can visit and who can volunteer and who can work. And essentially, the Biden administration made orphanages that receive government money, federal money, God-free zones. Mm -hmm. So we were allowed in if we promised not to proselytize and promised not to take the children to church and promised not to do anything that we were doing. Well, that didn't work. And now, when I called them up, they said, well, there's another rule which says you cannot have mixed uh, age groups. Um, elementary children have to be in one home, middle schools in another, and see high school in a third. And we've had even to break up families to disperse them across the state because we, we have only decided to take only high school age children. So um, it's just the bureaucracy and the ideology that is being shoved down our throats, even in God's country of Florida, is just amazing. It's just amazing and discouraging. Well, I think it's discouraging because I think in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, this is where the church gave up their social role. They decided, you know, they used to be the hospitals, they used to be the community groups, and slowly the government said, well, we can do that for you. Okay, fine. And we can do the hospital thing for you. Okay, fine. And we can privatize this and publicize this. And uh, at a certain point, the church says, Whew, good, I don't have to do anything. Well, guess what? <laughs> it came back to bite you. And now we find ourselves in a situation where it, we're terrified when we have to deal with a, a foster situation or an orphanage because we now have to step back and, and follow the government's rules where we used to rule at this. Kevin, you, you gave me a big hearty laugh as we were doing the pre-show because you said, you know, George, you should really want to have more people like this, more problems like that. And I'm having a tough time <laughs> with, with a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, and two women in prison and to think that, you know, and to have more people like that. But I think your point was that's what the church is there for, to reach the broken and the lost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've so... You know, I'm guilty of losing sight of that. Sometimes I think of myself as a chaplaincy for genteel people. You know, uh, my ideal parishioner is a newly retired active couple from the North who have money and time on their hands, mm -hmm. not a crackhead, not a mm -hmm. child lost in the system, not the poor and the lost and the hurt. And, you know, I, I reproach myself for wanting to take the easy path. Yeah, well, I do it all the time, so we're both guilty of that, George. Let's move on to a little bit of news. Uh, we uh, hinted last week that we're going to talk about the death of Pope Benedict. And uh, it's interesting because we have, as Anglicans, a relationship with Pope Benedict. He supported the early Reformation in the Episcopal Church, which, which or early, late Reformation in the Episcopal Church, which turned out to be the ACNA. Um, it, it festered into the S ACNA. And that's interesting because he sent a letter to Plano. Was it Plano 1 or 2? I don't remember which. Plano 1. Plano 1. Plano 1. And l let's talk a little bit about that and his encouragement of Reformation within the Episcopal Church. Following the election of Gene Robin, following the affirmation of the election mm -hmm. of Gene Robinson at the 2003 General Convention, there was the emergency primates meeting uh, at, in London, and then there was the first Plano gathering at a, uh, a Hilton, or it, yeah, at a big Hilton conference center in Plano, Texas, which is a northern suburb of Dallas. And I found you cannot walk around Dallas. It is not a pedestrian city. <laughs> it's a driving city. The, uh, this was, if you will, the reaction from traditionalist conservatives, middle roaders, number of bishops, large number of clergy involved, lay people. We came to this conference, Anglo-Catholics, Evangelicals, Charismatics, High Church, Low Church, Middle of the Road, all those who stood in opposition to the innovations being pushed by the hard left. And we had a surprise where Bob Duncan, who was one of the leading lights of this group, because I think it was first starting what was called the Anglican Communion Network, ACN. I don't know if it ACN. arose That's from right. the meeting arose from yeah. the meeting or whatever. But Bob got up and he read a letter from the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, Joseph Ratzinger. 
who would become Cardinal uh, Pope Benedict, where he gave his fraternal greetings and then affirmed the affirmed the fact that we were on the right course. Basically, he held out his hand in friendship and solidarity and offered prayers and counsel. And this was an electric moment. I was in the crowd and I then, you know, got to, you know, I think I snapped a photo of the, of the letter. I asked Bob, can I take a picture of it? You know, just to have it. This is before cell phones took pictures. I had my big old, you know, camera going, whir, whir, whir. <laughs> um, but this really was an electric moment uh, for the Anglo-Catholics in the room. I remember Keith Ackerman was crying. Um, Jack Eicher never cries, so he didn't cry. Uh, but the, the sense that we were not alone in this struggle. And a few years later, though, he, Benedict, who was on side in all the major issues, he basically destroyed the Anglo-Catholic movement in the Episcopal and the sure, Roman yeah. and the Church of England yeah. by forming the Ordinary. Ordinary. Yeah. Because that sucked the st many of the most fervent Anglo-Catholics out into the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Now, Benedict was bamboozled, I believe. He was given this song and dance first by the leaders of the traditional Anglican Communion, uh, that there are all these Anglicans in America and in England who were just waiting to come back on board. And Benedict, I'm not naysaying those who have joined the ordinary, but it's turned out to be pretty much of a disappointment. It's, it was not thousands, it was handfuls. Yeah, they, they were expecting yeah. 50,000 people in the Church of England mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. And Right now, the ordinary as a whole will fill a good-sized church as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, uh, it was overstated, overplayed. But what it did do was remove some of the more stronger, consistent voices uh, to that helped sort of keep the dike up, hold the walls up. And they sucked them into the, into the Catholic Church. And now what we find is that ordinary it, in many ways, it's certainly in England, is the ordinary of Our Lady of Walsingham. The ordinary is one option for England. Our Lady of uh, Walsingham, the chair of St. Peter in the United States, and I think the Southern Cross or something in Australia, there are three of them I'm aware of. And, you know, Gavin Ashenden, in his dealings, he's became, became a Catholic. He looked at joining the ordinary. And essentially they said, well, you're too controversial. You, you know, we just want a happy life. We've we've stopped fighting. We want to be good little girls and boys and keep our prayer books, but have the certainty of Catholic doctrine. And Gavin, you're too noisy. Uh, you're fighting the fight way past the point we want to fight. So the ordinary, it became almost tame in England when, yeah, uh, it when it joined. Yeah. And, um, uh, I have a personal stake because Gavin is our friend and oh, I wish you well yeah. and success. But yeah. Yeah. when Gavin is treated by the Catholics the way he was treated by the Church of England, you know, there's something wrong. Um, it's and But Pope Benedict knew something was wrong. Yeah. He originally, in my opinion, tried to clean the swamp like, like a Trump did. Trump mm -hmm. got into offices, I'm going to clean the swamp, drain the swamp. And Pope Benedict was the same way. He saw that there's a swamp there. But I think the people he was listening to and trusted were lying to him, and he was unable to clean the, uh, the swamp. Yes, just as Donald Trump's national security advisor and his secretary of state and all these people at the very beginning worked against him, trying mm -hmm. to sabotage every step he took. Uh, and the Washington blob was against Trump from the moment he appeared on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So too has Bennett, was Benedict hamstrung by the Vatican by the Curia and his attempts to reform it, to clean it up. One of our viewers from Hong Kong uh, sent me uh, some videos by, uh, I think it's Marshall Taylor, Taylor Marshall. I, I apologize for That's messing right. up the name. We don't have and to know everything. Them in, and I, where he talks about uh, Mar uh, Taylor, 
talks about how the uh, uh, Church of England, I'm sorry, Taylor talks about how the Catholic Church mm -hmm. has just been taken into captivity by an out of control bureaucracy, except Taylor sort of spices it up 10 times what I just said, with all sorts of words like sodomites and everything. Yeah, he, he, and, uh, he, he, he's a loud blogger, so to speak. And so we find ourselves now with, with Pope Francis, who is, I'm not going to say the opposite of Benedict, but I think he has this liberal trend that is fully accepted by uh the vatican well i'm told and i don't know this but you know what i read and what people who are informed tell me that francis is part of the wing of the church that they used to call the saint galen mafia uh about a place uh, in switzerland where liberal catholic cardinals met before the election to basically chart their way forward and francis was their candidate and Francis has his wonderful sides, um, but also Francis has his blind spots. And, you know, Kevin, you and I remember that we were told by uh, uh, the Anglican uh, Archbishop of South America, uh, uh, just, uh, why am I going blank like that? Yeah, make a choa or? No, 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 that? our friend, uh, the English guy, oh. Oh, uh, George, Greg Venables. Greg Venables, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, no, people want to know that last week we declared a dead person alive. So we're going to get mixed up once in a while in names. But, you know, this is, a, this, is, this is like watching the two guys from the Muppets uh, who sat in the balcony. Uh, and so that, that's, your, that's your Anglican unscripted today. Well, you know, Greg Venables said he was good friends with uh, Jorge Bergoglio and that he was somebody we Anglicans could work with and could count on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Justin Welby would say the same thing, but I don't think it's quite in the vein that uh, Greg Venables was saying that we could work with this guy. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a saying, do not attempt to speak Arabic in the house of the uh, Bedouin, which is, uh, don't try to uh, talk about other people's business because you don't fall for uh, expounding on Catholic things, but I will say Benedict was one of the great men of the early 21st century, 20th century, and his, I, I think he'll one day be named a doctor of the church for his theological contributions and writings. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I could so. see that. And, you know, he's followed in the footsteps of uh, Pope John Paul II, and, um, a very popular pope. Uh, who helped with the uh, the winning of the Cold War? So, uh, it's his legacy will certainly be drawn out years from now. He was not a, a seated or sitting pope when he died. Um, he was called emeritus or something like that. Um, but emeritus pope, it, emeritus pope. Let's. Uh, go ahead. Here's a funny thing. I've among official Catholicism their celebration of the life of Benedict is less fulsome than that in the conservative Anglican or conservative Protestant world. This, you know, they have a new prime minister of Italy who's a conservative. She declared a national day of mourning for, for Benedict. The yeah. Vatican didn't. Um, they uh, have not, you know, Francis's funeral sermon uh, Rod Dreher. Oh, that, the, that was so fair. Col oh. The, col the uh, very noted columnist, he, Rod Dreher is Orthodox. Sure. Uh, but he attended the funeral mm -hmm. and he listened to the sermon. And his point was this this oration could be given about, you know, the gardener. It had nothing about Benedict the man. It was mm -hmm. just your standard off the shelf, fill in the name here, funeral sermon. And why is the Catholic Church treating, I don't want to say disrespect, but treating not, they don't know the worth of this fellow, or they don't appreciate it, or they don't like it. I, I can't tell. I don't know. Well, I, I would also say one of the issues is that Pope Francis is now aged as well and may not have the energy uh, or wit or ability to put together. Uh, I mean, he's basically just a little older than uh, President Biden. I couldn't, 
you know, I don't know if you just can't put together a, a good homily at somebody's funeral, somebody's funeral, at Pope Benedict's funeral. It just may not be his capacity to do so now. Yeah, being honest here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I have on my list here, Cardinal Pell has also died. And uh, he came on our screens when he was uh, accused for uh, molesting uh, somebody in church and was jailed for 13 months, George. This was a travesty. It uh, really called into question the whole Australian justice system. Uh, and it was, if you will, the height of the witchcraft, witch frenzy. Hunt, yeah, witch hunt. Me, yeah. me true and abuse and all this and that. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, we had uh, the McMartin preschool trials and some of these things where just fantastical things would be alleged and the courts would believe it. And here, uh, in this particular Pell's case, he's alleged uh, to have molested a, uh, a chorister or an acolyte uh, in between services in a cathedral. Now, you know, the Cardinal's never left alone. And, you you know, you got 10, 15 minutes before the next show starts. And he happened to do this with nobody around, nobody looking, nobody remembering, and only this. And it was, you know, fantastical. It, it was fantastical, but it went to court. And the original trial court found him guilty and sentenced him, George. Yeah, I and mean, it was a, you know, police misconduct, uh, prosecutorial misconduct, judicial animus. And the appeals court threw it out. Not F, but he still had to spend 13 months in prison. And my Catholic connected friends basically point out that this all happened just as Pell was beginning to take a, a machete to the uh, Curia's uh, pink network and financial corruption. At just as Pell was about to sort of begin the cleaning of the house of the Vatican, uh, these false charges emerge and mm -hmm. the Vatican didn't step in to support or help or whatever. And in fact, uh, the, the fellow from the Vatican bank who is currently on trial, he sent a million Australian dollars to somebody in somewhere in Australia just about that time. And then it is alleged that this was used to sort of make sure they got rid of George Bell, Pell, yeah, Pell, yeah. uh, Pell, Pell from an, from an ecumenical point of view was much like Benedict. He was a firm Catholic. There was nothing wishy-washy about him. But because of that, conservative Anglicans, conservative Lutherans, and Protestants of all stripes could work with him, knowing here is where we disagree uh, on so many, many issues. But at the same time, knowing that we serve the same Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that our concerns about the cultural collapse around us are things we can work jointly on. We're not going to resolve justification by faith and things like that. Or the oh, place can't. of Mary. Uh, Mary and doctrine, no. Mary and doctrine. But we can work to make our societies better and safer and mm -hmm. push back against the Marxist ideology, the woke ideology that seeks to destroy us. Bell was rumored to have prepared a devastating study, critique of the woke corruption within the Vatican and the Curia, mm -hmm. and then he dies. And so there's some Catholic bloggers who are saying, isn't this, it's like uh, John Paul I, he dies mysteriously. It's like Godfather Point, Godfather Three, which is the bad Godfather movie, where you've got the corruption and mysterious deaths of leading clergy and this and that when they're about to expose him. So what it sounds like was help to his sounds, death, I don't know. It sounds like an upcoming Dan Brown book or something, you know, it should be well, good. You know, here's, here's the thing, you know, nobody really thinks enough of Anglican clergy to kill them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, there's nothing there's any of us can say or do from Justin Welby to George Conger that would make anybody resort to murder. No, no, not but, at all. <laughs> um, but uh, don't hear us say that we're defending all uh, Catholic priests that have been accused of misconduct. We are defending a person who was found by a secular court to be innocent of the charges. Um, there are plenty of priests in every denomination who have uh, um, done just the most evil things to uh, people under their charge. And those people should be convicted, serve time, and the, the church should find a way to uh, help and support the victims. We do not find this 
in Cardinal Pell's case. So just, you know, just hear us out. You know, oh, you're defending. No, no, no. He was found innocent by a secular court. Uh, let's go on quickly here. Philip North, we mentioned last week, was uh, up to be made bishop. He's been made bishop. There is now some pushback. Yeah, Philip North, suffering Bishop of Burnley, yeah, mm -hmm. is, is, but the, gov uh, the Prime Minister's office announced the King accepted the election of uh, North to be Bishop of uh, Blackburn, which is in the north uh, west of England. Uh, it's, yeah. it's sort of like being Bishop of Scranton, you know. Yeah, it's it's not London. It's you know. It's it's it's, it's not yeah. Winchester. It's not you know. Well, yeah. North a few years ago was to be Bishop of Sheffield, I believe. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Bishop of Sheffield right. yeah. and the women's groups and the liberals came out very strongly opposed, um, and under pressure, he withdrew his uh, acceptance of the nomination. Well, this time around, he's been asked a second time, and he's accepted. And the usual suspects have come out. I've got on my screen here a letter from Watch. Uh, Women and the Church Affirming, Challenging, Transforming, uh, which says that uh, we cannot support his position um, because some female clergy would struggle to flourish under his oversight, quote, unquote. So that... Uh, because uh, he would lead be a diocesan and not a suffragan, he would be directly responsible for all of these things. They cannot support him. And some of the usual suspects alongside Watch have come out in support. But having said that, some of the voices last time around are not there or they've gone the other direction. Giles Frazier, for instance, who is a uh, priest in the diocese, I think Southwark or London, London area, um, who is prominently on TV and in writing. He, he's a he's a character. He's an intelligent, articulate fellow, liberal. He opposed North on the same lines. But this time around, he's basically has said, let it go. Let it go. He's been crucified once. Let's not do it again. And he's well, shown it's, that it's he that just let it go. Who he disagrees uh, with. Well, not just let it go, but let them have one. <laughs> let the opposition have one, which I think is what happened to uh, the other side 35 years ago. Let them have one. And so that I think that's where oh. some of the liberals are coming down on. It's, it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's out in Scranton. No big deal. Let them have one. Now, he's replacing an evangelical, uh, the Bishop of Blackburn, uh, Julian Henderson, who retired and is currently the head of the Church of England Evangelical Council. So maybe Blackburn is where they place the unplaceable. It's the, in the Diocese of Central Florida, we always have Okeechobee. Uh, that's where you get sent if we need you, but we don't want you. Um, for our Okeechobee viewers, I'm totally wrong and I apologize. Uh, for everybody else, yeah, that's right. You get it. Um, the, uh, some of our English viewers have written saying, be wary of this. North uh, learned his lesson the first time round and has sort of pulled in his horns. He is a member of the society, which is the group of Anglo-Catholic traditionalists, um, bishops. And he, w because he will play ball. That's one, that's one uh, interpretation. A second is that... Uh, this is a token nod to the right before the left unloads, saying, look, uh, we're going to allow uh, gay marriage, but we'll allow people who are against it to flourish, mutual flourishing. And look, Philip North, here's an example that we can be trusted. I don't know if that's the example no, I, I would know. choose, but there yeah, you I go. Don't, I, yeah, I don't buy it. Because I have a vast understanding of how the Church of England works. Yeah, you and I have seen it now for uh, decades. But I want to bring up, you know, the, our number one story of the week. And that is uh, reparations are going to be paid to the Puritans who were forced to leave the Church of England uh, back and help 
uh, colonize uh, America. Oh, wait, I got that wrong. Justin Welby has announced he's going to give 100 million pounds to those who are victims of the Church of England during the slave trade. Wow. Yeah, this is virtue signaling at its worst and most inept. Uh, well, church commissioners t- to look into their uh, their basically, do they have any money that arose from slaves? And the Englands did a deep dive through their books, and they found that for 19 years in the seventh century, they owned stock in the South Sea Company. Mm-hmm. And out of this, Welby and the people in charge are basically saying, "We'll give a hundred million in reparations for those who suffered." who are ancestors of those who suffer from the transatlantic slave trade. Now, the big Archbishop of the West Indies, uh, Howard Gregory, he thinks this is a great idea because he's saying, hey, we're the black people in the West Indies. Send it to us. We can certainly use the money. And they can. Or the Bishop of West Africa, Archbishop of West Africa in Ghana and in the uh, and uh, those nations. Yeah, they don't have any problem with the Church of England sending them 100 million pounds Uh, to help build up those churches. Here's the problem. That's not going to happen. It's going to be paid to activists and to think tanks and to consultants and to perpetuate wokeness. Now, Kevin, your little joke at the beginning, my family was chased out of England as separatists. And first we had to flee to Holland. And then we had to get on this little rickety ship and go go to Massachusetts, which is freezing and cold. And, you know... Even before the slave trade, there were good English Anglicans who were forced out of their church, who became separatists and then separatists, then pilgrims. And I am an ancestor, and therefore I should be in line ahead of anybody who receives money for slave trades, because my pains, ancestrally speaking, predate the slave trading. Um, well, hold on. Let, you know, let's reverse the timeline. I have uh, press releases every couple months from six or seven people who have been demanding to meet with Justin Welby about uh, the victimhood they have suffered under the Church of England in the last uh, dozen years, and he won't meet with them. Are they going to get reparations? No, and are the abuse victims getting real reparations? Are they getting treatment? Are they getting help? Hmm. Are the people who are currently, you know, in a tort legal system uh, deserving of support? (laughs) Are they being helped? Absolutely not. Now, yeah. this this uh, this gift to the left, this gift to the woke from Welby has gone down like a lead balloon. The Daily Telegraph has an editorial saying this is stupid. When the Church of England is on the verge of collapse, to use its money to throw away like that is just an appalling act of poor stewardship. And The Save the Parish, uh, Marcus Walker, Save the Parish is the group that is fighting the grand centralization of the Church of England, breaking up the parishes into clusters and all this and that. Marcus Walker has a public letter that he's released, which is telling. And Marcus Walker is not a conservative. Uh, He would be on the liberal side of the, the slate. And he says, you know, what do these people think they're doing? I'll read a portion of it to the letter to you, which you can read in full on Anglican Inc. Diocese after diocese is embarking upon schemes to merge parishes into huge mega parishes while reducing clergy numbers to unsustainable levels and all for the diocesan deficits around one or two million pounds. He then offers examples where uh, Leicester is going to go from 100 clergy to 80 clergy and 234 parishes to 20 minister, minister communities. And the you know, that money, uh, it, the, the, all the studies point that decline comes not from lack of giving money to woke causes, but from lack of on-site clergy. You can't expect a church to grow when one guy's got to cover seven churches over a, a large area and has no ability to offer in-depth pastoral, spiritual, liturgical care where he's just a traveling uh, liturgy machine. Um, well, you were telling me that there was a, a sum of 176 million pounds spent on uh, church flourishing, and they claim they had 13,000 
people join the church because of that. Is, is that correct? Yeah, S strategic development fund. This was another one of these top-down grand ideas that was going to bring in 80, 89,000 people for the investment of about $100 million, where it's $176 million pounds. I'm sorry, not dollars, pounds. 176 million pounds is out the door, and they can only count 13,000 new bodies. So what does oh, hold that on. work out to? Hold, 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 hold on, hold on. Let's do the math here. All right. So if I have 176 million divided by 13,000, that that's 13,538 pounds per individual. George. <laughs> That's that's a well, you know, it's good stewardship because you're bringing people into the kingdom or into the church. So I don't know, Kevin. When it, when you pay twenty thousand pounds to hire a curate, they could hire what ten thousand curates and pay ten thousand curate. Yep, nine thousand uh, yeah. with the, with with the money they spend on the strategic development fund. Um, uh, Walker's letter concludes, the church has shown that it has the money when it wants for matters that it cares about. Before the church can find $100 million for this new project, it needs to show that it can sort out its own house, sort its own house out and fund its front line. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. This Walker is absolutely right on. Um, Gavin Ashenden has spoken on this on TV with Calvin Robinson, a uh, friend of this show as is gavin about how just incredibly foolhardy this reparation game is now in the united states we have some commission in california wanting to give a quarter million dollar to black people uh for reparations in california california is already broke and if they want to spend their money that way that's fine with them but uh, and i support it, that I, I mean if you as a, a state or an organization want to pay reparations fine but what we really need to be seeking after the age of slavery is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And in order for this process to work, um, the people we seek forgiveness from need to forgive us. And then we can talk about maybe moving into the age of reparations. But until you, you quantify this into a kingdom realm of I, uh, we seek your forgiveness, you're, you're just paying blood money. Well, and if, in one sense, I don't think the idea, the principle is wrong, but I don't think money should be handed to people. I think we should be investing in education, in mm -hmm. opportunity, in business mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. um, once upon a time, Florida and the South in general and Texas had terrible reputations for the quality of their public education. And we still spend far less than northern cities and places. Now the joke is that Florida has one of the highest uh, returns per dollar as measured by testing results and student achievement of any of the states in the country. And we don't do any of this woke nonsense. We don't have, you know, Stanford University now has more administrators than students. It's got 14,000 students and 16,000 administrators and only 2,000 faculty. This is an example of woke just going crazy, of money just being thrown away. If well, money were invested in trade schools, in you know funding, uh, you know small enterprise, if they want to spend money, spend that way, and alleviate this, the economic inequality that uh, persists in some parts of the country. Mm -hmm. But don't you know? Don't think you're going to solve a darn thing just by throwing it at race and color. Yeah, and I, you know, I can't. I no longer support the the college academia here in america uh, so i can't say just give them scholarships uh that's going to make I'm not the, the situation giving, i'm not <laughs> not not funded university system far from it um yeah. we uh, my daughters had a friend who was in their class with them father was a, a minister uh, he was a chaplain at an episcopal school down in vero and she, upon graduation from high school, went to Bard College, which is a very nice Episcopal college in the suburbs of New York City. And she borrowed 80000 a year for four years to fund her education. She was a jazz vocals major. Uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and I, I didn't hear that. After, you, you said something about a STEM education. What'd she have? Jazz vocals. Music. 
and her and she focused on jazz as a college degree. She now works in a Starbucks in Asheville, North Carolina. She will never pay off that student loan. Never. Never. I mean it's not even, you know, three hundred twenty thousand and the interest at five, six, seven percent a year on top of that. It's never gonna be paid off. And you know, when but we we fund the theft, essentially theft from the government cop coffers for places like Bard College to offer degrees in jazz vocals instead of teach training people. Uh, we have a young man in our my congregation, graduated from high school, went to the local technical college, community college for a year, and has started an apprenticeship with Otis Elevator Company. When he's done this apprenticeship, he's going to be making about $100,000 a year as an elevator technician. Now, this is not glamorous, but this man will immediately in his mid to late 20s step into the middle class, and be able to afford a home, be able to care for a family. And we don't have enough technical people. We don't have enough uh, mechanics and tool and die makers and uh, things of that nature in my modest well, no, but so we modest don't opinion. yeah yeah and for a long time at least the last 20 25 years we've really promoted a four-year education uh, mm -hmm. we did to our kids we said you got to get a four-year degree somewhere and we we will help fund it if it's a stem education um and so we, we really promoted that with our kids and uh our friends of the same age promoted it to their kids because the college, the college degree is your way into a good career. That's what we promoted. That doesn't exist so much anymore. I'm seeing so many people who graduate college and go and live with mom and dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's changed tremendously. Uh, in fact, I was just looking. In 1985, the tuition to University of Wisconsin was $900 a semester. Mm-hmm. It's now forty thousand for a year. That's crazy. That's the states, that's the state school. That's the that's state the school. State school. That's crazy. And then books, board, room. Uh, if you get a girlfriend, that's going to cost you money. You know, it just, it just never, it never ends. So, uh, all right, let's move on to our next topic of the day. Uh, oh, the back to the Church of England. They're going to be discussing at the House of Bishops uh, uh, to. A meeting. Let me start that over. January twentieth, the college, uh, the House of Bishops, and the Church of England will meet to finalize the plans around gay marriage. I don't know what that means, though. Are they going to living put about love it? and faith? LLF. <laughs> living the love and fraud. Are, but yes, <laughs> they'll have their final uh, gathering uh, mm -hmm. before they go to the General Synod in February. And so right now they're doing the last minute maneuvering. Uh, Bishop Inge, Inge, In Inge of Worcester has put out, uh, Inge is one of the five bishops who's already come out publicly for changing and supporting gay marriage. He's put out his justification. Uh, you'll be able to read that on Anglican Inc. Martin Davies, a, a theologian in the UK has put out his rejoinder basically saying, oh, come on, this is so weak. It's not worth even discussing. So we're seeing the last minute maneuvers before the meeting of General Synod, uh, before the meeting of the House of Bishops to hammer out what the grand compromise is going to be. There's been as much outside the meeting taking place as inside. After the first meeting last fall, we had the strategic leaks to the Church Times saying it's a done deal, it's going to happen. Now, what we have since heard sort of behind closed doors is no it's not a done deal but if but the church the those leaking to the church times wanted to so discourage the conservatives that they would basically throw up their hands and say well let's try to get the best deal we can rather than hold the line mm -hmm. we're not involved we don't have first-hand knowledge uh so we can't comment with any intelligence not that we comment with any intelligence on any topic. <laughs> yeah, gee, George. <laughs> but you'll probably hear whispers and rumors and attempts to spin and manipulate uh, the other bishops, the media, the people in the pew in the coming days. So let's hold tight, folks, and see what 
January 20th brings, if they even announce it uh, that day or the next day. or Well, now, recent memory, last 10, 12 years, they were always doing some studies at the Church of England and putting together some papers. And I don't remember the, the, the names of all these papers and reports over the last 10 years, but they've always come down in the end on the biblical side of marriage, on the, the traditional side of the church. And I, I, do I hold out hope that they'll do it again? I don't know. Well, in the past, you had an Archbishop, George Carey, who was firmly in the biblical camp. Mm -hmm. Then you had an Archbishop, Ron Williams, who was in the liberal camp, needed to have theological integrity, and we weren't there yet. Right. And, and now we've got somebody who doesn't care about theological integrity, Justin Welby, and has publicly stated, I just want the church to hold together no matter what. That's the most dangerous position to be, where, you know, he's willing to make a deal uh, of some sort and yeah. not stand on principle. Yeah, if Justin Welby sits down at a table and says, what do I have to do to keep the church together? I think that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. What do we do to keep the kingdom and the gospel uh, prevalent and active in society? It's a little different discussion. But let's move on to our next story. The ACNA House of Bishops met down here in Florida. I missed them, but they were over in Melbourne, and they have welcomed new bishops into the House of Bishops, George. Yes, the College of Bishops met in uh, Melbourne, but they stayed in Melbourne Beach, which is a nicer place. That's uh, nice. And they welcomed from uh, the from the Church of Nigeria, Bishop Felix Orgy and his suffragan, Scott Healy. Mm -hmm. They were released by the Church of Nigeria, and Bishop Orgy's diocese uh, is now officially part of the ACNA. And they uh, endorsed the elections of the Bishop of the Mid-Atlantic, Chris Warner, John Guernsey's old diocese, and William Jenkins of the Diocese of the Northeast and New England of the Reformed Episcopal Church. So four new bodies welcomed into the College of Bishops for uh, the ACNA. Nothing else has been publicly released, and uh, I'm not aware of any uh, great scandals or crises, but they no. never did figure out what they were going to do with the uh, church for the sake of others because the bishop went on a sabbatical and that sort of was put on the back burner i don't know and they've got uh, the they, upper midwest I, thing cooking so there are stuff's going to come out we just haven't been fully been. There w as we're all aware as reported here on and conscripted there was a secret conclave uh in Asheville, North Carolina, a couple months ago, and we, we haven't heard any rumors out of that, and you're not supposed to hear any rumors out of a conclave, of course, and they've had their House of Bishops, and there's a few things that George and I think should be on the back burner that they should talk about, certainly uh, uh, Todd Hunter's diocese and, and a few other things, but we'll have to see what happens. You know, otherwise, it, everything's rosy, and we'll have to see what happens, George. Well, All right. are rosy. the public public face is rosy we're just mm -hmm. trying to find where the rash is <laughs> the rash okay uh the diocese of the southern cross continues to grow that's a uh story down under almost yeah in carnes in north que north queensland uh, diocese mm -hmm. north queensland a parish withdrew uh and has joined the diocese of southern cross it's going to call itself northern hope anglican church so essentially, they just walked out of the building, handed the keys to the Bishop of North Queensland, and are now under uh, Glenn, uh, Bishop Glenn. Oh, Kevin, I'm getting old. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's right. Not Glenn Davies. Glenn Davies. Oh, Glenn yes, yes, yes. That's all right. See, I can <laughs> picture these people in my head, and I know their first name, but I can't. Oh, my. Glenn Davies <laughs> is the bishop of the Southern Cross, which yeah. is the break, which is the breakaway parishes from those churches that have those dioceses that have gone round the bend on uh, and their clergy cannot remain in good faith with the current bishop they have. So it's growing. It's steady. And we expect more to come. So 
the, there's been continued growth in the Diocese of the Southern Cross in Australia. We wish them well in all their We do. Yeah, we wish them more strength and power than our brain cells. Indeed. All right, final story. Tanzania has an upcoming primates election. Now, this is important because Tanzania was a forerunner, uh, kind of first province into the GAFCON movement and uh, was a GAFCON supporter until they switched primates. And then we, we discovered kind of a, a crack in the the cornerstone that is GAFCON, and that is that it's not done at a province level, it's done at a primates level. The primates have to agree to go on to GAFCON, but the provinces really don't have a relationship with GAFCON other than through the primate. And yeah. I, you and I talked about this Maybe seven or eight years ago, I said, oh, that there's a problem because we switch primates all the time. All the time. And Tanzania has probably gone through three primates since GAFCON won, George. Is this going to yeah. be a pro-GAFCON primate? Well, the election is shaping up as to be between Stanley Hote and uh, the current Archbishop Mambo Mendolwa. Now, both would be considered conservative, uh, but Stanley is definitely a GAFCON guy. If he were elected, he would bring Tanzania back into the GAFCON orbit. Uh, Mendolwa is as conservative as Stanley on moral uh, issues, but he likes to sit on the fence. He's not willing to break with Canterbury. Tanzania is a very poor country and receives a great deal of support from liberal uh, groups like the uh, USPG and Anglican Diocese, Church of England Diocese. So he wants to sort of keep a hand, uh, keep a foot in both camps. Stanley may follow the Mokiwa line. Now, there are accusations being leveled uh, of misconduct against both sides. It's, it's not the cleanest campaign that we're going to see. Do I have any per- information to support any of the charges? No, so I won't, I won't repeat them. Yeah. But we'll mm-hmm. just, you know, we just remember, you know, remember our problem with the first Tanzanian GAFCON primate, Valentin Mokiwa, was that he was dirty, uh, corrupt. Yeah. And we had heard that, but, you know, Kevin and I can't prove it. And then when he was defeated, all the corruption stuff came out and was released publicly. Um, but it's hard to, it's hard. It's almost like a meeting in the Catskills, a mafia dons sometimes, bishops' meetings. Uh, you know, uh, uh, but uh, like, for instance, the Bishop of Zanzibar, Michael Hafid. Michael Hafid is crooked. Uh, there have been lawsuits against him, attempts to remove him, and the National Church, House of Bishops, said you have to retire, have to have mediation. And Michael said, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not gonna do it. There was an incident at the cathedral there. I mean, oh yeah, this is this is the guy where he got in a you know he and his guys got in a fight with the cathedral parishioners, and his uh, his uh, miter was knocked off, and there's wrestling on the ground for the bishop's miter and everything. Um, you don't get that in Orlando yet. No, not but, much. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this, you know. It, it is difficult to get rid of bad bishops anywhere. Look how long it took to get rid of Charles Benison. In Upper Shire, we've got well, that wonderful uh, bishop. I, did they get rid of him? I thought he just kind of retired out. No, Benison was... Uh, Benison was out, you know, was helped out the door. Oh, helped out the door, okay, all right. Um, but in Malawi, we've reported about the bishop who was found uh, guilty of all sorts of bad things. And, mm-hmm. and then... Uh, the diocese said you had to go. A province said you have to leave. He said, fine, I've got a contract. And if you want to buy me out, it will cost you a million dollars. And the, uh, the province said, we don't have a million dollars. He said, fine, I'm staying. And then they, the, the archbishop uh, pulled a little, pulled a quick one where the uh, Bright Molossa skipped a meeting with the archbishop to discuss his fate. And he said, ah, you skipped a meeting. You're now a heretic. I excommunicate you. You're out of the job. And we don't have to pay any severance. Well, a labor court in uh, Zomba 
in uh, Malawi said, uh, 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 you got to pay him a million bucks. He's got a legal contract. So Otherwise, the bishop found a lawyer, huh? Bishop found a lawyer. He's a good American Episcopalian, Bright Malasa. So he's still in place. He can't get rid of the guy. Wow. Incredible. Oh, Can I have man. a personal prayer? This this Saturday, we elect a new bishop in Central Florida. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, we have a great candidate, an okay candidate, and a problematic candidate. So pray that the Holy Spirit moves us. <laughs> Amen. To go, yeah. pr Pray the Holy Spirit moves those there to elect someone who will be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will keep Florida bastion against uh, uh, the innovations and corruptions of the national church and pray we don't go through all the hassle that Florida has gone through in trying to elect, trying to keep Charlie Holt. Oh, man. I mean, Diocese Central Florida is one of the, the, the few remaining conservative dioceses, and we pray that you would elect a bishop who would use that voice who would stand firm and maybe not uh, be qu quiet or docile, but would say, no, we know is but, appropriate. The, here's the funny thing. God works in mysterious ways. The Holy Spirit can work even against the most uh, sinister plans, plans of men. The process in Central Florida has been pretty dreadful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not been transparent. It's not been very good. You couldn't ask questions of the candidates. Everything was pre-written. It was an 815 fix, if you will. Yet the Holy Spirit has raised up one and a half candidates who stand fully in the tradition of John Howe and company. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, you know, you can't, you know, God may not quite, God may be done with a good part of the Episcopal Church, but he's not done with us yet, down here. Down here. Way down here. All right, that is a full show. What do we got? Fifty-six minutes. That's great. That's a th that's a good show, George. Let's move on. I'm Kevin Carlson, and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode seven hundred and eighty-one of Anglican Unscripted.